I am so excited for you to listen and watch this conversation with Janine Wise. You probably aren't familiar with her name, and that's okay. When you finish this conversation, you're certainly going to know who this wonderful, lovely, beautiful, genuine, authentic, vulnerable woman is. She is a woman in recovery, and she is someone who attends refuge recovery meetings. And I really wanted somebody who was embedded deeply in refuge recovery, who understood the ins and outs, would come on and share with us what it's like to attend a meeting and what refuge is all about and share their story. And Janine has an amazing story. So here we go with Janine Wise. Here, we wanna show you what's possible in the world of sobriety. We introduce you to the various tools, programs, and resources available, because there are way more options than you may even realize. We want you to find the one that works for you. And we do it through people. People who share their pathway to recovery and will help you find your path to freedom. Because getting sober can feel hard enough. You don't have to do it alone. I'm Sarah Roberts. And I'm Roger DeVoe, and this is Sobriety Starts Here. All right, well, I am excited to be introducing you to Janine Wise. She is a lady who's going to share with us about her foray into recovery with Refuge Recovery. So welcome, Janine. Hello. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for asking me. I'm so happy to have you here because I know that, you know, you're somebody who is not necessarily in long-term recovery. You're sort of two, not quite two years sober, but you found your way to refuge recovery. And so I wanted to deep dive right out of the gate into refuge recovery. So what is refuge recovery? What is the experience for people and who is it for? So start off with what is refuge recovery? Okay, great. So uh, Refuge Recovery is a Buddhist path to recovery from addiction, but it's non-theistic. You don't have to believe in a higher power. You don't have to be Buddhist. They just use um, the triple gem of Buddhism to take you to recovery. So that's the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And what those three things do is represent part of your recovery. So when we take refuge in the Buddha, what we're saying is we take refuge, we believe in the possibility of our own recovery. We believe in the possibility of our own enlightenment. When we talk about the Dharma, the Dharma is the path. How do you get there? So it's uh, the teachings, which for us is our refuge recovery book and pretty much anything else you're using for recovery. And then the Sangha is the fellowship because you can't do it alone. And so um, the triple gem, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, is the possibility of our own enlightenment, the way to get there, and who we do it with. Mm -hmm. So it's also based on the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. The words, it's not changed. We just, the, the Four Noble Truths are the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. For refuge recovery, we just changed it so it specifically applies to addiction, but we didn't change the meaning. So from the Refuge Recovery book, um, we follow the traditional Buddhist system of the Four Noble Truths, which begin with four actions. So the first, four, the first noble truth is we take stock of all the suffering we have experienced and caused as addicts. Number two, we investigate the causes and conditions that lead to addiction and begin the process of letting go. The third noble truth is we come to understand that recovery is possible and take refuge in the path that leads to the end of addiction. And then four is how do we do that? We, we do that through the process of the eightfold path that leads to recovery. So there's eight actions that we work on that help us recover. So in the fourth noble truth, then those eight things are listed. So you've got understanding, intention, community slash communication, action slash engagement, livelihood and service. Number six is effort and energy. Number seven is mindfulness and meditations. And number eight is concentration and meditations. So can I ask then, Janine, is, are the eight noble truths, is it, is it likened to the 12 steps? Is it following that kind of similar path? I don't know if you're familiar with the 12 steps, but is it, is it in the same way that people work the steps? Do you work the truths in that kind of same vein? 
Well, um, kind of. Actually, uh, Bill W. said in the 1930s that Buddhism, you could replace all that with the Buddhist tenets and it would work the same, maybe even better. I don't know. I don't want to cause trouble. But he was definitely aware of um, the Buddhist path and it is applicable to recovery. Um, we don't work steps, but we take inventories with a mentor. So we might call them, you might want to call them investigations. There's the first uh, truth inventory, the second truth inventory, and then they're working on a couple more. So the first truth inventory, it's, it's a process of questions. There's like 30 questions here, and it's basically how you suffered. You write an intel, a detailed inventory of everything that's happened to you. How did you get here? The second truth inventory is how did you cause suffering? And you do that. We don't have sponsors in refuge like you do in 12 step. We have mentors and we like to call them spiritual friends. So there's a concept in Buddhism called Kalyanamita and those are spiritual friends. So because refuge is new, there's tons of questions about what we're doing. What's a mentor? Is it like a sponsor? And since refuge is so young, a lot of people, if they haven't gone through the inventories, they're scrambling on the internet like, hey, I don't have anyone to mentor me. I need a mentor. There's no mentors around here. So what we decided um, is just mentor each other. Just go through these together. Be spiritual friends. Just help each other. Mm -hmm. There isn't anything like, oh, you have to call me every day. You have to attend this many meetings. Nothing like that. It's just, hey, let's get through this together to try to overcome addiction and figure out the reasons why we we were doing this and the, take stock of the harm we caused to others and recover. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned Bill W who uh, wrote the big book of, um, of, of AA. And so is it Noah Levine who started refuge recovery? And is that, is he who wrote the book then as well? Um, yes. So it's, it's Noah Levine, but Levine. I said Noah Levine for like a year until I met him. <laughs> um, he is credited with writing the book, although a bunch of people started Refuge together. He didn't want his name on the book, but the publisher wouldn't publish it without his name. Mm -hmm. He comes from a long Buddhist tradition um, of uh, American Buddhism, but through Theravada. Theravada. And um, he had started against the stream Buddhist meditation society in California a long time ago. And out of that came Dharma punks, which was just like a, a very cool way that these tattooed skateboarder punk guys were studying the Dharma out of that, because Noah is in recovery from addiction came refuge recovery, him and a bunch of his friends thought it up and, um, got the book together It started refuge. Do you know if Noah, um, did he start in 12 step recovery or did he bypass that altogether? And just because you, you were saying that he's sort of rooted in, in Buddhism, how did that, how did that stem out for him? Well, his father, his father, Stephen Levine, who's passed away, um, is a very well respected, I guess you could say famous Buddhist teacher. And so he did grow up in that, but he rejected it. He just thought his parents were weird hippies. <laughs> but he started getting in a lot of trouble, uh, juvenile delinquent, drugs, vandalism, things like that. And he ended up in juvenile hall um, facing several felonies. And he was really scared. And so um, on a phone call with his dad, he finally listened to his dad. His dad said, hey, do you want some help? And Noah's like, yeah. And he goes, okay, well, I suggest you meditate. And Noah's like, I, I want a lawyer. <laughs> um, so he, he meditated and he meditated for a year. He hated it for a year and a half before it finally clicked. And then he's followed that path other, ever since. But to get back to your question about 12 step, that was the only game in town. So he absolutely attended those meetings and he still attends 12 step. So that's kind of a, a misconception or people's common tendency to make it an us versus them or what like a, to compare. Mm -hmm. Well, if you like refuge, you don't like 12 steps, things like that, that are natural for us to do as humans. 
he still goes to 12 step for the fellowship and whatever personal reasons he might have. And there's a lot in the 12 steps that can help a lot of people. So not everyone that's in refuge is saying, Oh, I just hate the 12 steps. That's the worst thing I ever heard of. So I'm going to do refuge. A lot of people do both mm -hmm. and they do it very successfully. Mm -hmm. Just like there's some people in um, 12 step that are like refuge sounds crazy. That is, you know, that's not my cup of tea. There's people in refuge that say, Hey, I grew up in 12 step. It's the worst because we're human and we have human experiences, but it's definitely not us versus them. I really love that. I love the inclusivity of that and the approach that, um, again, when we're trying to create whatever type of pathway or um, uh, program for ourselves in recovery, it doesn't necessarily mean a linear path. It doesn't necessarily mean there's only one approach, one thing that we do. Um, for example, in my life, nutrition is so big for me, health and wellness and meditation, yoga. I pull in all of these things, 12 steps. There's some of that that I've worked through. Um, and, and now I'm very curious about, about refuge recovery. So I'd like to know what is the experience of attending a refuge meeting? Because I know they're all over the world. I believe they're also online. So I want you to share with us what is the experience of a meeting. And I also want you to share that you are the person who started the refuge recovery in Chicago, which is exciting. Okay, so two things. I did not do that by myself. Um, refuge Recovery Chicago, I started it with my friend Alex, who's traveling through Asia, and um, he had already meditated with Noah. Um, so I just want to clear that up because I don't want anyone to think that I, I'm taking credit for that. Not that you were implying that. And then I really liked what you just said about recovery not being linear because the eightfold path that I mentioned, those eight things that you can, you should do in order to solidify your recovery and investigate the causes of why you got addicted in the first place are not meant to be worked in a linear fashion. So the eightfold path are the eight spokes on a wheel and they're meant to be done all at the same time or jumping around and they all work together, which is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's some parts that um, I have trouble with in my personal life, like right speech. I have a lot of work to do on right speech. And so I'll delve into the other spokes of the wheel and until I feel a little stronger and then it helps support me to go into right speech. So you end up working all of the of the eightfold path eventually at the same time but to your to your point about what you're saying about uh linear that's what i do like about it mm -hmm. okay so what is a refuge recovery meeting like generally they're an hour and a half long some places do it in an hour some places do it in an hour 15. um generally they're an hour and a half you take the refuge recovery book when you get in and you start with announcements. Can you show and, us a cop your copy of the sure. book? It's pretty beat up. That's the um, best kind. Yes, this is uh, the, ref the refuge recovery and it's, this is my baby. Mm -hmm. um, I love this book so much. Mm -hmm. So you it's, like come a Bible in a, it's like a Bible in a textbook all into it, unto itself. And while you have the book in your hand, are you able to t um, flip to the page where it shows that the, the spokes in the wheel, the wheel, if you will, of the, the eightfold path? Kind of, Sarah. They okay. don't, there's not a drawing of okay. the eight of it as the um, spokes. Hold on. But you have the process. Mm-hmm which lists the four noble truths and then you start with the eightfold path there which comes around here and then the whole book goes into explaining that mm -hmm. so your part one the four truths of recovery addiction creates suffering mm -hmm. i mean it had me right there i'm like yeah. yes i know please help me <laughs> you had me at hello <laughs> You had me at suffering. Yes, for sure. So uh -uh. just before you keep going with what a meeting is like, where do most of the, the refuge recovery meetings take place? Um, do you mean physically? Yeah, like for, for Alcoholics Anonymous, it's typically church basements. I'm wondering where do most refuge recovery meetings take place? 
Well, um, I can speak for Chicago. We started at a recovery center. It's called New Hope Recovery Center, and they're amazing with us. Um, several meetings are there. And then we went into a psychotherapist's office that's mindful psychotherapy. We are actually in an Alano club that was, it's the first time in 30 years at the Newtown Alano club that um, they've allowed another, a meeting that's not 12 steps. So it's a big deal. It means a lot to us. We're very respectful of that relationship, very grateful. Um, we've wow, got talk about collaborative, like that just feels so energetically positive. I love that. Yeah, it's cool because I'm not going to lie. And, and you might've felt it too. There's because of that tendency to us versus them, mm -hmm. there is suspicion, you know, on both sides, like what's this crazy newfangled thing. And then I'm tired of 12 steps. I'm not doing that. So there can be that. And we have a lot of work to do to say, Hey, we're all trying to get to the same uh, end. We just, we certain peeps, like we prefer different language. That's it, you know? So uh, Refuge Recovery speaks my language. 12 Steps speaks the language to them. Uh, we also have a meeting in a Dharma center, which is really nice. And there is a huge online presence in Refuge. So in Chicago, we have about 11 meetings a week. And there are meetings worldwide, but there's people online that, you know, their closest refuge is three hours away or an hour away, and they just can't get there in person. So there's a lot. Um, you can attend refuge recovery meetings at intherooms.com. And intherooms.com has tons of meetings. There's 12 stuff. There's everything. But there's refuge meetings on there as well. There are a video. I attended one. And I there are phone meetings of refuge too. And if you go to the main refuge recovery Facebook page, you'll find those. There's a women's refuge group. There's a lot of secret groups that you just have to ask to be added to because it's like the women's. Um, and then there's a lot of closed groups like um, refuge recovery mentors, refuge recovery process addictions, all sorts of things. Because like in 12 steps, depending on what's going on with you, you might go to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, uh, Sex and Love Addictions Anonymous, and you could fill up your life going to different fellowships for all the different things that you want to work on. In Refuge, you go to one meeting. We, it's a one-stop shop because all addiction creates suffering. It's the same way out. So we have people in our meetings that are um, in recovery or trying to be, get in recovery from alcohol, from overeating, codependence. Um, we have someone in meetings that really touches me because someone dear to him committed suicide and he's trying to get through. So he found, he takes refuge with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, the spouses like, are- Like recovering from grief at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the spouses don't have to go to Al-Anon. They can go to Refuge right with their partner or different meetings because wow. it's all the same thing. So it's one fellowship because this all creates suffering and we're all taking the same way out of suffering. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of a meeting, is there, so, so I'm going to just mention for anybody watching right now, um, visit refugerecovery.com and check out where meetings are happening in your neck of the woods. And if this is something that you're really pulled to, maybe you'll start a meeting in your neck of the woods if there isn't one already the way Janine did, because, um, you know, I think it's, it's really growing. It's something that is gaining a ton of momentum. And I really do what, what I'm really connecting with what you're talking about, just the way that it feels, the inclusivity of it, and the, the understanding that there is not one single path to recovery and that we all are trying to get to that same end, like you said. So you arrive at a meeting and do you all sit around in a circle? Like how does it, what's the experience of going to a refuge recovery meeting in, in physical form, not the online groups? Okay, so um, like you said, we're online. I would go to refugerecovery.org. We're a nonprofit. If you go to refugerecovery.com, I believe you can get to .org, but refugerecovery.com is Noah's Treatment Center in Venice, California. So the only reason we need to make that clear is because the .org doesn't fund the .com. 
-hmm. just to be transparent. Excellent. So you get to a meeting and it depends what kind of room you give us. So at the Dharma Center, we've got cushions on the floor and chairs. It's up to you how you would like to sit. At the recovery center, it's in chairs. If it's the Tuesday night meeting, they might be in a circle because we know that's a smaller meeting. Um, on Friday, they're in lines, they're in rows because that's a huge meeting. So it really just depends. Mm -hmm. And then you sit down, there should be a book on your seat. You're greeted. The person who's leading the meeting, the facilitator, makes announcements and they say, you know, I am not an empowered Buddhist meditation teacher. I am just here to lead the meeting. And then um, the, it starts with a 20 minute meditation. Some places will set the room for mood. They'll shut the door. If you know, there's something going on in the hallway, they'll dim the lights. That's all well and good, but it doesn't have to be that way because the kind of meditation we do, which is Vipassana, it's insight meditation, is a, an observance, observance of your thoughts, observance of where you are without judgment. So if, if people take a group conscience and want it dark, fine. There's a meeting that when the door is closed, um, I've seen some people get triggered because it's a small room. Mm -hmm. So we keep the door open. Mm -hmm. It just depends because um, the conditions are never going to be perfect, just like life isn't perfect. And you can meditate anywhere. You can meditate on the train. I do it every day on the way to work. Yeah. And it's loud. And as Noah taught us, we can incorporate that into our meditation. So do you need to have a meditation background to be able to come in and do this kind of, like, I don't want anybody to be worried that's watching that's thinking, oh, I don't know how to meditate or I'm terrible at meditation. I'm not going to be a good fit for, um, for this type of recovery. What are your comments there? Sarah, I am so glad you asked that because I have to tell you, when um, we started Re Refuge Recovery, I had not read the book. I did not have a meditation practice and I was still drinking. I just mm -hmm. knew that I needed it. Mm -hmm. So you do not need a meditation background. I have noticed this tendency with people who aren't familiar with meditation. I'll get a lot of messages from people that may want sobriety or may not. They might be, you know, not in recovery, but they'll message me and say, I am so stressed out. I'm having the worst time or someone just died. I can't take it. How do you meditate? And I tell them how, but I also say it, you know, in a very polite and respectful way, it's not that it's a patch or it's not something that's going to fix you in that moment. It's the establishment of a daily practice that over time is going to bring you that relief that you need because what meditation teaches you is the response. So because you've established that practice over time, when something when something unskillful someone does something unskillful towards you or the circumstances of life are stressful or difficult you have trained your mind to to say okay right now it's like this so if you don't know how to meditate there's a lot of misconceptions people think oh i'm gonna learn how to meditate for an hour at a time it's gonna be amazing you know you don't need to meditate it for an hour at a time when you're first learning meditation, especially if you're in early recovery and you have monkey mind, a minute is a miracle. Yeah. Um, I would, I recommend a program on the Insight Timer app by Michelle Zarin. It's called 2020. Um, it's like 2020 Meditation for Peace. And she's not involved in refuge or anything. I just found her on Insight and she helped me. And you look up Michelle Zarin as a teacher and you start with one minute a day guided and it's a 20 day program and you get up to 20 days and that's how you can establish a practice. I found that really helpful. Wow. Also, if you're attending refuge, just keep going. And another misconception people have is, and I thought this too, um, well, I was thinking the whole time, so I suck at it. I, I'm a failure. I'm not doing it right. I can't stop thinking. And the point is not to stop thinking. The brain is going to think. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. There's two things about that that I have to say that helped me a lot. One is you can just observe your, observe your thoughts without judgment. So, for instance, 
let's say you're meditating and you're feeling good, you're feeling at peace, and all of a sudden you realize that you're doing the grocery list, you're thinking of that perfect thing you should have said at work to that person who makes you angry, <laughs> and it's off to the races. Yeah. Instead of thinking, you know, I'm a failure, the whole practice is to say, oh, thinking. You can label it with the word thinking. There's lots of tricks you can do. Sometimes I'll notice I'm thinking and put that whole thing in a, in a thought bubble and let it float away. And you keep coming back to the breath. Mm -hmm. Another thing they say is the difficulty is the practice. The, the point isn't to win. The point isn't to not think. We're always going to think. We're going to think nonstop. The point is not to judge yourself while that's happening. It's not to turn off your thoughts. There is a form of meditation um, that the Shambhala people use called shamatha, and that's calm abiding. And that's also a form of uh, thought observation. And then Zen is a little different as well. But what we do, which is a Vipassana, which is uh, insight based, is just a non-attached observation of your thoughts. Um, the second thing that I was going to say about meditation that I found helpful is that and what I learned in refuge, and I did le learn this from Noah, is I don't have to do what my brain says. I am 43 years old, and I did not know that. I thought my thoughts, if I think something, I should do it because that was my plan. That's what's happening. I'm using my, the product of all my education, my experiences, my common sense. So if I'm thinking that, I'm, I might be on the right track. And that thinking got me in a lot of trouble. Um, and so I learned that whatever kind of scheme that my, my brain comes up with, I can say, that's really cool. You know, we'll talk later. Or when you're meditating and your brain's like, that's cool. Well, I'm going to just go back over the past 20 years of regrets. <laughs> you can say, that's nice. That's cool. I'm going to concentrate on my breath. Mm. But from all that, I think it's important to notice that it's to know that it's not a magic bullet. It's not a cure. It's not a quick fix, but a daily meditation practice over time will teach you a compassionate response in times of stress. So now when things happen to me because of refuge and because of meditation, I'm able to say, let me, let me take a step back instead of being reactive and think about what's going on. Think about what this other person's going through you know, maybe not everyone's out to get me and, and have compassion for myself as well. Mm -hmm. We do a ton of meditation called, um, Metta and Metta is loving kindness. It's one of the four heart practices. They call it the four Brahma Viharas. You've got Metta, which is loving kindness, compassionate, compassion, equanimity, and generosity. And those are four, four things that we strive for. And when you do a meta meditation, I do one almost every day, it changes and opens your heart. So you start out, we do a lot of meta and refuge, getting back to what happens in a meeting. Will it's the dealer's choice of what meditation they want to do. Uh, there's a lot in the refuge book. At the end of the book, there's an appendix with a lot of meditations. But sometimes we'll play something from uh, Jack Cornfield, who's Noah's teacher, Sharon Salzberg, uh, Tara Brock, we love her. Something that's in our in that lineage of Theravada, um, Thai forest. And when you do metta, you close your eyes, and this is guided, and you think of someone who is beneficial to you, um, and you you wish them peace, you wish them happiness. Uh, a lot of times we'll start with ourselves, though, and we'll – um, direct loving kindness and compassion to, towards ourself. And then you go to the benefactor, someone who's been beneficial to you and direct loving kindness towards them. And then you pick someone who's maybe a little more challenging in your life. And we're instructed, don't pick the hardest person. You know, it's not, it's not a competition to like heal these relationships in the 20 minutes that we're um, meditating because it might bring up a lot of powerful stuff that's better off that you go through with a therapist and so the, but then you send them loving kindness you bring it back to the room you bring it back to your breath and then you send this loving kindness towards all four directions 
the um, dying and those being born, the seen, the unseen. And when you do metta almost daily, um, it changes you. It really opens your heart. So um, that's a little bit about meditation, but I have tons more to say. Yeah, but what a beautiful way to honestly, to start a meeting. I imagine that that's just really powerful for everybody. And, and I love that you've said, you do not have to have a meditation practice already, but I do want to make the point, the word practice is there for a reason. This is not something that we are supposed to begin and be experts at immediately. It's something that we practice daily, like Janine was saying. So Janine, so keep going. So during a meeting, so now we've, we've um, entered the meeting, however it looks in the room, whatever room we're in, we've now done a 20 minute meditation. And now what happens? So after the 20 minute meditation, we read from the book. Um, and depending on the meeting, it can be where we left off last week. It can be once we get all the way around the room, we stop. It can be the whole chapter, what have you. And then um, when that part's done, it's open for sharing. And we ask you to keep your comments focused on what we read or where, or where you're at today. No crosstalk. Um, and we go around the room, uh, it's dealer's choice, um, I'm sorry, it's whoever wants, it's speak as the spirit moves you. It does say in the book that it's tag pass, like if I share, I pick the next person. And some refuge meetings do that, but we don't. Um, Did you feel like just, that just put too much pressure on people that may not be ready to share? Well, I this is just my personal opinion, how I would take it, but it's not an official stance or anything. I don't like it because you're going to have that group of OGs that has been around forever and maybe a newcomer won't get picked. Not saying that that's always going to happen, but you just never know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like similar to 12 step meetings where um, you just speak as the spirit moves you and then we wrap up with announcements and uh, Donna, which is the donation. You can give what you want or keep coming back, like you say. And then we close with the dedication of merit uh, to all suffering addicts uh, everywhere. And that's that. It's really cool. Oh my gosh. It sounds amazing. I love it. I know that there is a meeting here in my neck of the woods and I'm definitely more inspired to go and check it out. Um, but now what I want to do with you is get right back down to your history and walk through a little bit of your story so that we can kind of come full circle and understand how you went from where you were to where you are now with your practice, with refuge recovery in your life, doing all of the amazing things you are doing now. So can we go back into your story as a, as a young girl and then you can walk us way, all the way through? Yeah, absolutely. Um, where to start. I know, I know. And it's, it's different for everybody. A lot of people just really like to share, you know, I grew up wherever you grew up with parents in the way that you grew up with your parents. Like you can just, you can decide where you want to start. It's all up to you. All right. That sounds good. Um, so I grew up South of Detroit and, um, there was addiction in my family, uh, from my mother. And, um, I started drinking very young because I thought it was glamorous and everyone was drinking. I drank the same way everyone else drank. Can I ask how old were you when you say very young? Well, um, probably 13, although I had experimented before, mm -hmm. but I started drinking when I was 13 and I started smoking cigarettes. Um, so I grew up uh, starting in middle school going to Alateen. So I had familiarity with 12 steps. And um, I never really thought about my own drinking, but I knew that it made me feel better. And I knew that it turned the party on for me and that I could be the life of the party and that it was just really fun. I had a great time. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I, I just started drinking more and more, which still seemed fine. But then after college, um, people started changing their lifestyles a little bit. And that's when I went off the rails. My drinking didn't look like other people's drinking. 
So when I first got out of uh, college with my bachelor's degree, I had a job with the federal government and that was supposed to be my dream job. I was an economist and I hated it. And I left that job. And when I left that job, I was so lost because I thought this is everything I prepared for. Um, what do I do? And I thought, well, I'll wait tables. I always liked waiting tables. I'm going to wait tables for money until I figure it out. And to get into that life cycle or that lifestyle at a point when I was lost and confused is I think I always was going to become addicted to drugs and alcohol, but that, that was like off to the races on steroids because that's what everyone was doing. Yeah. And we would joke that it's not even a joke. It's true that we had two shifts you'd have the shift at the restaurant and then you'd close the restaurant at 11. You'd leave at 11 30, 12, 12 30. And you'd have your second shift at the bar and Chicago has bars that close at 4 a.m. Yeah. And if you wanted me to go out after work and it wasn't at a 4 a.m. bar, you could forget it. Cause I wasn't going to go to a 2 a.m. bar and then a 4 a.m. bar. Mm -hmm. I was going to sit down at that 4 a.m. bar and drink my face off just like we all did. Um, and I did that for a really long time. And I think that that's when my addiction got really bad. Mm -hmm. And that's when people noticed that's when my family started getting worried about me. And I wouldn't say I outright lost jobs or relationships because of alcohol. Like at the time I thought it was different things. I thought, Oh, we broke up cause we didn't get along or I left that job because it was stupid. But now when I look back on it, a lot of that was because of alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, my mother passed away in 2013 of um, cancer related to smoking and drinking. It was esophageal cancer. And me and my sisters and my dad took care of her um, during at-home hospice for quite a while before she passed. And my parents were worried about my drinking at that time. They knew it was bad. They knew, they saw how much I was drinking. It was a lot. Um, oh, but to back up just a little bit, I was drinking, I was drinking by myself by then. Mm -hmm. So I had drank myself out of the social drinking because the way I was getting, the way I was behaving, I was getting in fights. I was driving drunk. I was behaving in very unsafe ways to myself. I, I should be dead right now, dead or in prison, a, a lot of things mm -hmm. um, because of the way I was acting and the situations I put myself in. And so uh, um, someone gave me the bright idea, um, someone I was dating, he said, you know, you drive drunk home from the bar and you spend a lot of money at the bar. You should just stay home and drink. And I think this was about 2007. And I said, that's stupid. Only losers drink at home. Like who would do that? And then I tried it and I'm like, this is awesome. No one can see what I'm doing. It was just when people started uh, chatting online, like in, in Facebook and things like that. I'm like, I can interact and nobody knows what my true condition is. Cause I can't even speak. Mm -hmm. I would get blackout drunk every single time. So once I figured out that drinking at home, no one could see what I was doing and I could drink the way I wanted to, mm -hmm. it escalated even worse. And that's, that was really bad. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, I drank every single night for years. Mm -hmm. The only times I wouldn't drink is if I was too sick from drinking the night before. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times I power, most of the time I try to power through that and drink anyway. Yes. Oh my so, gosh. I mean, can I just interject just to say that I know that my head is nodding profusely and I know that if my head is nodding profusely, I am not the only one. I just want to honor you in this moment for sharing so vulnerably and openly with us because you are not alone. Believe me, I have the exact same history. Drank as a young girl, worked in the restaurant industry, closed bars, then went to the next bar and didn't have the smarts that you did of not bar hopping. <laughs> like we did do that. And totally that same story of then just realizing that drinking home alone was just so much easier. I continued to drink socially, but then I would go home after when everyone else went home to bed, I was not going home to bed. So yeah, I love it. And I, I just wanted to just take a moment just to, to give you a breath and just to remind you that I know that
that this is scary to share at times, but wow, how beautiful and, and, um, and open and, and we're really grateful that you're sharing. So keep going. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for sharing that. It means a lot. And I know what you mean about drinking a certain way in front of people. I used to call it, I was proud of my drinking in a, I found, I thought I was very rebellious and yeah. I don't care. I don't give a F mm -hmm. and screw you. Mm -hmm. That was my persona. Mm -hmm. Very street smart, very um, edgy, sarcastic. And so the, what, how I would refer to it is I would go out and drink the way other people were drinking, the weirdos that would have one or two drinks. And then I would go, I would call it, I would go home and drink as God intended. Mm -hmm. um, and about working in the industry during those years, I never did get back into economics or it was international studies, anthropology, all that. I decided to go to culinary school and I became a chef. Mm -hmm. So I wonder about that to the, to, I wonder about my motives. Of course I love food. I love to cook. I love to lead kitchens. I'm good at it. There's a lot that I like about it, but I wonder if in the course of that, it was, my decision was informed by how accepted it was to, to drink like that. Mm -hmm. um, so back to my mom getting ready to way. I asked her, I thought we were going to have this heart to heart about my dad before she died. And I said, mom, what do you want me to do with dad after you pass away? And what I thought, what I meant was, do you want me to come visit more? Do you, what do you want me to do? So like with him and she said, I need you to quit drinking. And I was so offended. Like, excuse me, we're not talking about me here. Oh. I was, and I'm like, how rude they had expressed um a lot of just confusion and dismay about how i acted and when we were down there that last month that my mom was uh in transition my oldest sister was there as well my middle sister we were all coming and going but there was at one point that my oldest sister and i were there together and she was appalled at how I drank and she told my parents how you know like she got it through their heads how really bad it was and so another thing before my mom died my mom and dad sat me down and offered to send me to rehab and again I was I was like how dare you what are you talking about I'll quit when I want I don't want to quit I'm single I don't have kids I can do what I want you drank like this to my mom mm -hmm. And, um, I got really mad at my sister. I'm like, stay out of my business. Mm -hmm. Well, my mom passed away. Um, and in a way it was beautiful because we all got to reconcile with her in our own way. Um, a lot still comes up for me, but it's different than how I felt about her my whole life. She drank for a lot of the same reasons I did, which was because I didn't have proper coping skills. So I used alcohol to medicate and she had gone through a lot of trauma in her life and I don't blame her. There's a lot of things I didn't know about as a child. I was just mad because my mom was a mess and she wasn't a mess all my life. Um, but when she went off the rails, it was bad. It's bad for kids to be around that. Yeah. So um, after she passed away and I'm trying to deal with her the those words in my mind you know that you have to quit drinking mm -hmm. we i was um hitting it really hard at their house at my parents house after she died and my sisters came and everything and i was blackout wasted of course one night and my sister my oldest sister said to me you're worse than mom ever was and i that stopped me in my tracks i'm like I had never thought of anything like that in, in my life. My mom was the, the biggest drinker I ever knew, the biggest mess I ever saw. And she was like the extreme. And I never thought I was like her at all. And when my sister said, you're worse than her, of course, my first reaction was uh, denial and being defensive. And it somehow got in. I'm like, she's right. Wow. This is bad because even though my mom had kids and did it, I didn't have kids. So I was taking it a lot farther because I was just by myself all the time, no one to answer to, no husband, nothing. 
So around 2013, I started trying to get sober. And the only game in town was AA. And I would go to AA three times a day. If you are trying to get sober in Chicago and you're into the 12 steps, you are in luck. There's over a thousand meetings a week. And so I would go and I would just sit there to not drink. I would sit there and plot and drink and I would go drink. Um, It just went on and on, but there was something that wasn't clicking for me. And there was also a meeting I found called the heart of recovery. The heart of recovery is run by uh, the Shambhala. So we have a a Chicago Shambhala Center here in Chicago, and it has a heart of recovery meeting. It's once a week, and it's a meditation meeting for people in recovery, but it's not attached to any program. You just go and meditate, kind of like refuge, but they don't have a book, and then you share, and that's it. And so I was going to AA a lot, and I I found this heart of recovery meeting, and I really identified with it. I had this feeling in that heart of recovery meeting that I didn't feel anywhere else. I felt like I connected. In AA, I had a different experience because I felt like I was doing it wrong. I felt like because I wasn't connecting with it, I was flawed. Now, I was raised Catholic and I don't have any problem with any religion. But there are parts of it that, you know, I have my own issues with. And it really upset me that this problem that I created could only be fixed by a higher power. And I didn't like that at all because I thought, I did it. I want to fix it. I'm very headstrong like that. Give me the tools. So what was happening in AA is that I would think my way into a corner and I couldn't get out of the corner. So what that meant is when I didn't feel good in AA because I, I didn't like the language or I couldn't get it, people would say, well, you need to work the steps. And I'm like, well, I don't want to. Or I would make a half-hearted attempt and I would feel a lot of resistance in myself. And so then people would say, so we're getting closer to that corner in my mind. So then people would say, well, take what you need and leave the rest. And I'm like, okay, I'm leaving the sponsor and I'm leaving the steps. I don't want to do them. And then when I would leave that, people would say, well, you're terminally unique. So I thought, you know, wherever I went, it just got into this corner where I couldn't win. Mm -hmm. That's not an AA problem. That's not a people in AA problem. That's a me problem. It just didn't work for me. And so at that time, I'm at this this heart of recovery meeting. And I'm like, I want more of this, just like a good addict. I'm like, whatever this is, I want more. Why isn't there a program attached to this? And I wasn't a Buddhist or anything. And so I started Googling um, Buddhist recovery, meditation for recovery. And I had even thought if there's not something like this, I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to make one. And that's what I had in my mind when I started Googling. And so from 213 to 216, I was in and out of sobriety. I'd get eight months and drink a few days. I'd get four months and drink a few months. So I was trying, but it wasn't sticking. But I knew that the best thing I had going was that Heart of Recovery meeting, which I still attend and is lovely. And there's Heart of Recovery meetings all over the place. They're so nice. So. Um, When I Googled this, you know, variations of Buddhist recovery, meditation for recovery, refuge recovery popped up. And I was like, oh, thank God, you know, somebody else did this for me, which is crazy because I'm not, I wasn't even a Buddhist at that time, but I was going to do it. And so um, there was a refuge recovery Facebook page for Illinois, and it was very slow going in there. There wasn't a lot of activity. And I got in there and I saw that there was a refuge meeting in the suburbs close to me. And so, and there was another one in Woodstock, which is another suburb about an hour away. And I wasn't going to do that one. It's important to talk about that Woodstock meeting because my friend Tyler started it. It was the first refuge meeting in Illinois. And he's also one of the people that helped start Refuge Recovery Chicago. So he's great. Um, 
so I was going to go to this meeting in this other suburb and it just seemed online that maybe it wasn't going on. So I put a post up and I said, Hey, is anyone interested in starting a refuge recovery meeting in Chicago? I don't know how to do it, but I'll help support. And Sarah, it was like, you know, when you're in a concert and that song comes on and somebody lights a lighter and then all of a sudden all the lighters are up. Mm. I get, I, I have chills right now. Mm. It was like, it combusted. Mm -hmm. I put that post up, I believe in June of 2016. And we had our first meeting July 29th of 2016. Wow. Alex spoke up. Um, oh, so then I go to an AA meeting and my, my friend is the speaker there and he's not anonymous. So I believe I'm allowed to say this. And he was saying how meditation was a part of his story. And so in the comments, I said, hey, there's this refuge recovery thing I want to try out. I'm sorry if I'm speaking about another fellowship, but I just really like this meditation stuff. It's helping me, but I don't know how to do it. And he came up to me after the meeting and he said, I just got back from retreat with Noah Levine and I've read the book and I'm like, okay. So he stepped up. Um, then Tyler stepped up because he started refuge in Illinois and then, um, uh, oh my gosh, Jeff, Jeff stood up. Jeff is the owner of New Hope Recovery Center. And he, he said, I got the space. Alex said, I know how to do this. I, I want to do this. Tyler said, I know how to do this. And I said, I don't know how to do any of this, but I'm good at connecting people. So I was in charge of like the Google Drive and where are we going to do this and where are we going to do that? And I, it took me, um, actually a year after refuge started that I actually read the entire book. And I said in a meeting one day, I said, you know, you guys, I kept getting distracted reading the book. And I, I said, but over the course of the past year, you read it to me, my mm -hmm. Sangha, my fellowship in meetings read the whole book to me. And I'm like, man, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. So Refuge Recovery Chicago went off like gangbusters and it's growing and thriving ever since. Um, so when so did beautiful. you, so we, I don't know if you want to get to this point now, but when was it that then, so you, you know, your mother passed away, um, you've been given this, you know, last message that she's given you that she needs you to quit drinking. You've been trying to quit by going to AA. Then you now, you know, you find refuge and you decide to get started. When do you decide that's it for alcohol to remove it from your life? When did you get sober? Thank you for asking me because obviously I go off on tangents and I like this part of the story. So I'm glad you brought me back. So I had, we had started refuge and um, I think I got irritated with someone. So I used that as an excuse to not go to meetings and to start drinking at people. And I love when people say that. And I love using that term myself. I started drinking at people. That's so it, right? Love oh, yeah. I mean, my, a lot of my addiction is self-righteous anger because, you know, I'm always right. Mm -hmm. People aren't reading my mind and they're not behaving the way that I think they should behave. And I, that is a big part of my story because I would get mad at people at work and it would ignite what I called like a fire and a thirst. I would get very hot inside, physically hot, and that would start the, that's why I'm drinking tonight. Yeah. It took a couple years to realize that I started creating situations. My addiction was that yes. insidious that yes. if there was nobody to get mad at, I was gonna find somebody. Yes, I think that that's such a common theme with, with people in active addiction, um, some people will say that they're triggered by stress. So then they create stress so that they can be triggered so that they can justify the drinking or the um, drug use. I, I totally can relate to that. And I know a lot of people can as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that there's others like me. Um, yeah. So we started Refuge in uh, summer of 2016 and I started drinking again. Um, and then it got to obviously right back to my daily blackout or nightly blackout drinking. Mm -hmm. And, um, and are you still going to meetings, refuge meetings at this time and hiding it at all? Or, or how did that look in your life? 
I stopped, I stopped for a couple months. You know, I had already started, I stopped for a couple months and that's when I started ramping up my drinking again. But I was miserable. I had to quit. My, I have had spectacular bottoms in my life. I have gotten in serious trouble. I've caused serious trouble. People have known about it. Um, I've had alcoholic seizures while driving. That was seven years ago, and I didn't quit. A lot has gone down where you would think I would quit drinking. Mm -hmm. But the bottom that I got to this time, so I ended up stopping for good October 6th, so two months of drinking after refuge started, is that my internal landscape was scorched earth. I was lying to everyone because I needed to look normal. I needed to um, behave in a way. I needed to, people to think I was kind of rowdy, but I had it together after all. But the way I felt about myself inside, I, I knew that I was gonna die. I knew that I was going to not, probably not make it another year. The things that were happening in my body were really scary. Um, you know, I have Crohn's disease and I have endometriosis. I have no business drinking. I have no business drinking. And so I was not doing well, but I could still get up and work. So I'm like, everything's fine here. And um, I was dying inside spiritually, morally. It was bad. And so I knew that I couldn't take another day. So even though I had rock bottoms that were more dramatic, what it came down to is my heart said to me, I want you to live. You know, you're actually worth it. You're worth survival. Mm -hmm. And you didn't know better. So let's find some tools. And so um, it's really weird because I was drinking and smoking out on my curb in front of my house. And I had just talked to my dad earlier that day. I love my dad. He's ama an amazing person. He's uh, my hero. He's never let me down. And we're very close. And he's always looked out for me. I had talked to him earlier that day because it was his birthday. And I'm sitting on the curb wasted and I'm like, hey, I should quit today because it's his birthday. That's really serendipitous and that's a good anchor. I know in other programs they say you can't quit for anyone but yourself and all that. And that's fine for them, but I can't. I quit for my mother because she couldn't. And if you knew what she went through, you would have, you know, died drinking as well. And I quit for my dad because of how much he loves me. So I quit drinking and smoking cigarettes on the same day. And I haven't had a cigarette since. And I haven't had a drink since. And my mother drank and smoked her whole life. So the esophageal cancer, which turned, was, went down to stomach cancer, they often say are lifestyle cancers from drinking and smoking. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know what, mom? I'm going to do it. It stops here. You know, they say that um, now there's the field of epigenetics where trauma travels through generations. Mm -hmm. And if you looked at my mom's family tree, um, you'd be crying within about 30 seconds. And I decided it stops here. So I quit on my dad's birthday. And it's funny because I'm pretty active on online, online recovery. And um, hip sobriety had gotten on my radar and I was in love with Holly Whitaker and I am to this day. Yes. And so hip sobriety was starting and I said, I'm going to do this. And I enrolled in hip sobriety school, which, you know, you can look up and it started, I believe the week after I quit drinking and smoking. So I had seven days sober and I started attending hip sobriety which is where I cultivated the daily meditation practice was through what she taught. And I threw myself back into refuge. So because of those two things, and then there's two other things that are really important for my toolbox. Um, I, I live in recovery. I don't call myself an alcoholic. I don't care if anybody else does. I'm not anonymous. I don't, 
I might have a disease that fits in the DSM where how my body reacts if I take a substance, but I don't believe I'm flawed or diseased. And I also believe that I have the solution. So I learned coping tools and hip sobriety and I had fellowship and the path, the Dharma and refuge. And I've remained um, in recovery ever since. So my recovery is based on what I do to maintain it is refuge recovery, everything I learned in hip sobriety, the insight timer, which helped me immensely and is free. It's a free app for meditation. And then this, um, it's called uh, Yoga with Adrian, And it, she's got, I think, 3 million YouTube su subscribers. And I managed to find her serendipitously right before 2017 started. So I got to kick off, you know, January 2017 doing her free yoga. And her yoga is all about finding what feels good and not bendy pretzel crazy, crazy stuff. And it really opened something in me. And she, she means a lot to me, even though I've never met her. So just like people come to meditation and think, well, I'm not good at meditation. People can come to yoga and say, well, I'm not flexible. And that's exactly why you need the yoga and the meditation. So that's helped me. I also participate in She Recovers um, with Taryn and Dawn. I was able to go to Bali last year on one of the women's retreats. Amazing. So I, I live in recovery and I'm not anonymous because I have nothing to be ashamed of. Like Holly Whitaker said, um, I got addicted to an addictive substance. Yeah. No big deal. I just oh. needed coping tools. I love that. And just to interject for a second, Hips, uh, Holly Whitaker, uh, she shared with an interview here as well. So anyone that after we, um, after you finish watching this one with Janine, you can head over and check out Holly Whitaker's interview right here on the same site. And uh, that Insight Timer. So that's an app. It's free. It's amazing. It's something that I use as well. And, um, and Yoga with Adrienne. Her name is spelled A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E. -E. And, um, and I know that, one, oh, it's one, one N. N. Okay. Yeah. A-D-R-I-E-N-E. -E, and she has a lot of free video, you know, lots of free content out there. So check her out as well. I think those are really great tools. In fact, that's usually one of my questions when we're nearing the end of our time together, which I wish wasn't ending because I'm loving this conversation so much. But what other tools? Do you have any other tools that you want to share with us other than the ones that you've just highlighted? Um, I would say that... Let me think. Because I know you're a beekeeper. So I guess part yes, of what I was thinking was... Yeah, I have a beehive back there that I have to harvest from. It's amazing. Well, yeah, those, that's my, my life is... Um, well, you know, I have the chef background and now I'm working in sustainability with the chef where... Um, well, I teach sustainability at a culinary school in Chicago one day a week because of you know my background with slow food chicago and beekeeping and veggie gardening and then i work with a chef in chicago where i'm helping him with research to write a book and i work with um this culinary training program that we're doing for low-income people um, i'm helping with the tv show that the chef has and i'm the education manager for the company so those things are all in line with my values and with sustainability as well well, absolutely. And it, what it makes me think of is just for so many people, when I have these conversations, meaningful work is such a big part of their recovery. And so I can sense that with you. And it makes me sort of um, track back to a point where you made wondering what things would have been like had you followed that path in the you know in the economics field. And if you hadn't had addiction play such a big role in your life, and if you hadn't and I'm sort of one of those people that I, I, I love to look at those things and I love to wonder what if, but then I quickly bring myself to yes, but if I hadn't gone through all of what I'd gone through, I wouldn't get to be where I am right here and right now. And to me, as someone on the outside looking into your life, it certainly to me looks like you have created a beautiful path of just a holistic lifestyle, let alone uh, a woman in, in recovery. So I think what you're doing is absolutely on purpose and amazing. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, it's fun tying all the things I like to do together and getting paid for it. I realized at my age, I didn't want to be a chef running service anymore. And I really thought I was going to get out of the industry. But then this opportunity came up with this chef that I've admired um, for a very long time. And so I was happy that came up. So 
yes, in my, you know, as a hobby, I'm a beekeeper. I have two hives in Chicago and I plant my own veggies in a garden just across the street, a community garden. And then one thing I really like that um, helped me is in 2017, I came across a course called Path to Freedom through the Prison Mindfulness Institute. And I ended up taking that course and I started taking meditation into uh, detainees, inmates at the Cook County Jail here in Chicago. And I really like what our sheriff is doing. Um, he, he thinks that over half the people in Cook County Jail, which is the largest jail in the United States, should be in substance abuse programs and rehab. And I think he said that 90% of them need mental health, health help. And, you know, like I've alluded to, I think, I think that I could be in prison right now if I was caught or if I was not let go. And I do believe a lot of that's based on my race. And so I, I've always been a lifelong volunteer and I thought that's what I'm gonna start doing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start volunteering. So I got into Cook County Jail and I started taking uh, meditation to the inmates and it was so beautiful. Um, I took refuge, the Refuge Recovery book in there and they liked that a lot. And I did, um, it was just really cool. Like one time I said, guys, do you want to do a forgiveness meditation next week? And they said, yeah, what's that? And I told them, I said, you know, you're going to cry. And they're like, yeah, yeah, right. And I came back um, the next week and, you know, I was meditating with all men, male inmates. And we did the forgiveness meditation where you forgive yourself and you forgive someone who's done harm to you and you forgive someone you've done, done harm to. And a lot of them cried and I was like, I got you. And I knew what, I know what that feels like. I cried too. Cause something shifts when you're doing forgiveness and loving kindness, meditations, compassion, generosity, and equanimity. And the one guy said to me, I said, why are you crying? How do you feel? And he said, um, I never knew that I wasn't a bad person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, neither did I. And so it was just really, it just, it just means a lot to connect with people like that. Um, I feel a strong affinity for people that have had uh, justice involvement. And I, I, that's the service work I want to continue in. I haven't been to jail, that jail meditating in a few months because I am working two jobs right now, but I want to get back to it. I love it so much. Uh. And that's um, the service work I like to do. Since I don't have time to volunteer right now, I needed to figure out some something I could do at home on my own time. So right now I'm finishing up translating the Refuge Recovery book into Spanish, and I'm gonna give that as a gift to our worldwide Sangha, whoever wants it. Um, I gotta figure out you know, how to do the whole publishing thing. It needs to be proofread. I'm not done with it. I'm hoping to get done with it before our refuge recovery conference in LA at the beginning of um second week of June and so hopefully I can get that done but yeah um I stay busy because I should be dead I should be locked up and I'm not and I'm grateful and if I can help another person by not being anonymous and by helping them cultivate a meditation practice you know I'll do it it helps me Oh my gosh, Janine, you are literally giving me goosebumps. I feel like I'm not doing nearly enough when I hear and listen to you and all of that, all that you have done and are, are doing. And I'm just so impressed with you. Thank you so much for being with me today. I didn't know where this conversation was going to necessarily lead. And I'm so grateful to you for being so open and willing. I want to ask you a couple more questions before we have to close for today. All right, here we go. What is the best thing about being clean and sober? the recovery of my own potential. Mm. I love it. I love that response. And this last one, I'm going to borrow from Oprah. Janine Wise, what do you know for sure? I know that I'm worth it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's what I know for sure. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you. You're beautiful, an absolutely beautiful person. Thank you for everything that you're doing. If people want to connect with you and go further with you, where do they go to find you? Well, um, you can follow me on Instagram. You can friend me on Facebook. I'm, I'm not an authority or an official spokesperson for refuge, but I'll help you out. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to start a refuge meeting, I know that people want to walk into, they're like, I don't want to start a meeting. I want to be in a meeting. I had to do it. It worked out. Um, there's lots of resources online. So I would direct people if they're looking to take refuge to um, avail themselves of the Facebook groups, just start putting in refuge recovery and, and start liking and joining what pops up. If you're a hundred percent lost, then please reach out and I'll set you on the right direction. Mm. Oh my gosh. This has been truly an honor and a privilege to spend time with you. Janine Wise, thank you so much for being with me today. Namaste. Thank you so much. This was really amazing. Thank you. To get access to all of the free videos and interviews, visit sobrietystartshere.com.